everyone is involved in some sort of merging with each other's culture. I can tell you as quickly as people in India are embracing uh, wealth and uh, business, uh, traditional business and non-traditional business models, people in, in the West are uh, involved in ancient traditions of mindfulness in business, being good corporate uh, responsible citizens, that kind of thing. It's wonderful. The transformation from kind of, uh, you know, being a Wall Street guy and really with the kind of corner office and very expensive shoes <laughs> uh, to being a guy with no shoes in a monastery sounds dramatic, you know, but it has to do with uh, inner transformation. It has to do with inner change. And actually that started here in India as it does for many people in the West. I'm just telling you uh, that the Buddha did say some things very specifically about business and money, and what to do with money. But, but what did the Buddha say about uh, business leadership? We're here to talk about business leadership. So um, he actually described in, in uh, some of the sutras three qualities of a sec successful business leader. Yeah, man, you're talking about 2,500 years ago, right? Shrewdness to succeed, like being clever in business. Skill to win customers, but capability of generating trust. Honesty. He talked a lot about honesty. And usually from the context of if you're not honest, you're not going to get money. <laughs> and if you don't get money, you're not going to live. And if you don't live, you're not going to be able to practice all of these other right ways of living. So it's a very practical kind of, uh, these are very practical kind of teachings. He also said some things that, uh, uh, about saving money. 25% of your money should go for household expenses. 50% uh, of your money should be invested in your business. And 25% uh, should be saved for emergencies for a rainy day, this kind of thing. It's incredible, you know? Uh, to think of, of it, there was actually this kind of practical advice at that time. And can you imagine saving 25% of your money? Nobody does that. You know? um, if the Buddha also mentioned uh, in terms of right livelihood, now we're talking right livelihood, some of the things that you should not uh, engage in, and this is also 2,500 years ago, you have to understand, but uh, trade in weapons, uh, slaughtering animals and fishing, military service, uh, deceit and treachery, maybe he's talking about politics, I said. <laughs> uh, Soothsaying, or what is known as astrology today. Trickery and money lending. Of course, a lot of these ancient traditions uh, don't like lending, and there's a lot of reasons for that. When I was working on Wall Street, uh, I began to do something called socially responsible investing. And that, that's a, a burgeoning field that is still in existence today. In fact, more and more present in the way that people invest. And there, there were, just to give you a quick idea, there were a couple of ways of doing it. One was sort of a negative screen, and one was sort of a positive screen. The negative screen would screen out the bad stuff. You know, traditionally, weapons manufacturers and alcohol manufacturers and this kind of thing that might be harmful to society. But there's another positive screen that would screen in good things. And fortunately, these days, uh, wide sections of our economy are, are, are actually good screens, like most of the technology sector. This is beneficial in, in a lot of ways. He also laid out some policies for how business leaders should treat employees. Uh, assigning work according to capability, meaning don't make people do things they're not really qualified to do, if this makes sense. Uh, giving due wages. Yeah. This is something that we're all concerned about, with, concerned about these days. Who's making uh, the most money in the corporation? How many times the lowest employee salary is the highest employer salary? Uh, you know, this kind of thing, but um, giving due wages for work assuring health care, sharing occasional luxuries, that means giving bonuses. If the company does well, uh, the Buddha advised to let all the, all of the employees share in the profits. 
and giving leave and time off. It's amazing. Some of the things that the Buddha said is this. Uh, practice mindfulness. Practice right livelihood. Work for the benefit of others. Serve society as well as individuals. Adapt quickly to change. Everything changes. Admit failures and turn them into opportunities. These are all tenets of business practices, business leadership practices that are found in the in the sutras, in the, in the canon of Buddhism. Now, there are some other famous Indians who said some other things that sound suspiciously like what the Buddha was getting at. My favorite, be the change that you seek in the world. By your Gandhi. Uh, Embody change. Personal transformation ensures social change. A great man is different from an eminent one in that he is ready to be the servant of society. Servant of society. One of them is mindfulness. There's a lot of ways we can have this, these conversations, you know. But uh, self awareness can be learned through the practice of mindful meditation. Self awareness. How, how to really understand who you are as a leader and your capabilities. You know? The practice of mindfulness meditation teaches leaders to be fully present, aware of themselves and their impact on other people's lives. It teaches them to be sensitive to their own reactions to stressful situations. This is very important as a business leader to know that there are certain things that you're not that good at. <laughs> uh, leaders who are mindful tend to be more e effective in understanding and relating to others and motivating them towards shared goals. So now you're talking about a whole different way of, of running a business. You're talking about listening to others understanding what other people need in order to be motivated to accomplish shared goals, in order to serve the greater good of the company, of other people and society. So th these are some of the characteristics that um, this Harvard Business Study came up with of failed business leaders in today's environment. Uh, they lack an awareness of themselves and their own actions. They don't understand their own motivations what's motivating them. They've not fully accepted their own fears and failures. Quite common for business leaders to say, I'm not a, you know, I never fail, and I don't have any flaws, this kind of thinking, which is uh, uh, not an effective way in the long run. They've lost sight of their own values, especially under pressure to sustain success. And they lack self-awareness and are seduced by money, power, and fame. And here are some characteristics that they found of successful new business leaders. They're genuine in their intentions. They understand the purpose of leadership is serving customers, not yourself. They practice their inner values consistently. They balance their inner and outer motivations. They build trustworthy, trustworthy relationships. They operate with a high level of personal discipline, and they have a keen sense of self-awareness. I, I created a, a small project that, um, under the uh, sort of principle of small is beautiful, I keep trying to keep it small. This uh, principle by Yev Schumacher, who invented the term Buddhist economics in the 70s, and um, the idea of creating change on a small scale, this sort of Western understanding of authentic leadership with Eastern wisdom about the mind and the discovery of self, which has been developed over centuries. Uh, and this new generation of Buddhist leaders in this room, I would say, uh, have to operate on all levels of society now. One thing so interesting about India, uh, from a Buddhist perspective, maybe you know this or maybe you don't, but in the, in the, in the sutras, it said that uh, there, there will be 1,000 Buddhas, yeah? And we're only on number three. <laughs> yeah. 
So there's 997 more coming. And um, all of the Buddhas will be attained enlightenment in India. There are many kinds of Buddhas. <coughs> Buddha of compassion, Buddha of long life, medicine Buddha, Buddha of the future, maybe the Buddha of business leadership. But how do you ensure that it's something that is ingrained in you? And um, how, how do you, basically my question is, how do you become a leader like this? Well, it's okay to know that this is what you should be. How do you become that? Right, right. Well, that's, that's what, uh, that's the difficult part, right? Um, I think I said in the beginning that this is, this is not a, a traditional lecture about a new business method that you can, you know, take notes and go home and say, I'm going to do this uh, tomorrow with my business. Um, this, this is a way of seeing business that is uh, it's changing rapidly. And that is that one must change oneself and the way that one operates within the business environment. One must uh, achieve a type of personal transformation uh, and then social change, business change automatically comes. So, so then you're, you're sort of asking the question, how do you achieve inner transformation? And that's not easy, right? Of course. And the, the answer is, uh, it's different for everyone, right? Um, and that, I think, is the sort of beauty of uh, this approach to business leadership, is that we all have different skills. We all have um, very, very different personalities and very, very different ways of acting in the world. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, my, my style of, of working in the business world is when I was an investment broker, I, I, I can't stand to be part of an organization. I, I don't think I ever went to any meetings, ever, or like rarely, in, in so many years. There was a Monday meeting I never went. And um, just give me a phone, and, you know, and, but um, I'm quite good at connecting and going out in the field and connecting with people. And uh, so that, that, was, that was my sort of skill. And also a little bit, slightly confrontational. So when I went to um, the monastery, and I was in class, and, and all these uh, teachers talking about um, benefiting sentient beings, helping people, benefiting, benefiting. And frankly, I didn't see any of them doing it. Frankly, I saw people sort of meditating and not doing much. And I kept, I kept asking the teachers, you know, you're always talking about Mother Teresa. There should be a million Mother Teresas in Tibet. Where are the Mother Teresas of Tibet? This kind of thing. You're just poking, poking, poking. And finally, the, uh, I said something like that to my lama, and he quite clearly said to me, with a little bit of, not a little bit of firmness, look, all we're talking about is go out in the world with the skill that you have and help whoever appears. And that is the kind of the message. You have, everyone has a kind of skill, whether it's connecting with people, whether it's research, whether it's analytical uh, abilities, and through the process, and I even hate to say it, but of sort of mindfulness, the process of slowing down the mind, creating space, and frankly, just doing a little bit of meditation like so many business leaders are doing now, those qualities naturally emerge. Those qualities naturally emerge. But we were talking a little bit on the side here about uh, so, so you become more mindful. So what? You know? Maybe you're more mindfully a bad person. Maybe you're more mindfully greedy. More mindfully defeating the competition. So, so mindfulness alone doesn't do anything, actually. But it does make you understand how you are. When your mind calms, you become aware of the self and how you operate in the world. And then you start to have a little control over things. Otherwise, you, you're running an organization that's out of control. So I hope that gets a little bit to, towards your question. There is no fixed answer, because each person has their own unique set of skills. But the process for revealing that unique set of skills is the same. And this is a kind of mindfulness. But my question here is that uh, if somebody's sitting and just doing nothing, is that the meditation, or if somebody, like, uh, knowing the problem, what is that, and how he can reach uh, to the solution to that problem, and, like, where brainstorming. For me, I think uh, 
acting upon the problem is uh, meditation, not uh, just sitting idle and uh, maybe seeing the candle or something. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a really, um, that's a great observation. And uh, it's something that, you know, I, I totally, I totally get where you're coming from. And, you know, we have this idea that uh, people who meditate kind of sit in caves and don't do anything. And in some ways, that is true, actually. In some ways, that's true. And there's, there's a kind of reaction against that, right? Uh, and in the West, it's become called engaged Buddhism. Engaged Buddhism. Frankly, it was started by Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Zen monk um, and winner of the Nobel Prize. You know, I'm sure you know Thich Nhat Hanh. So, so uh, we all have jobs, right? Or, or we all hope to have jobs. So this, this kind of practice, which is a little bit as you described, uh, resting the mind, calming the mind, gaining control over the mind, and, and seeing oneself for what one really is, that is accessible. And it's also kind of accessible, you know, 15, 20 minutes a day. You know, it's not that difficult of a thing. You don't need to go to a cave. Um, and so that kind of self-awareness is really all that they're talking about in Buddhist philosophy, you can say, is the idea of uh, two truths, yeah? There is the relative truth, and there is sort of the ultimate truth. Uh, on, on the relative, on the relative level, to a simple example, uh, this is a podium, yeah? We all agree to call this a podium. But if I take an axe and, and break it into small pieces, everything's still there, but it's no longer a podium. It's because this is not, there is nothing inherently uh, podium about this. There's no podium molecule. It's just something that has appeared, and we agree to call it this. So on the relative level, for sure it's a podium. I'm using it. On, on the ultimate level, there's nothing called podium here. So um, uh, on the relative level, you're a student here, I assume. You have all kinds of uh, wonderful flaws uh, and all kinds of wonderful problems. But on the ultimate level, you are absolutely the Buddha. You are absolutely, you contain Buddha nature. It means you have the potential to realize the enlightened aspect of yourself. We get to something about Buddhism being a religion and also being a philosophy. Yeah? So many times people say, oh, Buddhism is a philosophy, not a religion. And um, so that discussion is a big discussion, yeah? But um, you can say that uh, there is a, philo a, a, a very, very uh, precise philosophy behind, behind all this. Whether or not that philosophy is being used by the practitioners, that's another story, you know? And you can make a really good case for um, people who are sort of born into religious systems not really practicing the tenets of those systems. Yeah, I think, I think all religions suffer from that, you know? We, we have great uh, philosophies by these great people, the Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus, and we were sadly we're not following a lot of it, you know. But uh, because Buddhism has a kind of philosophy that can be stripped away from religion, or religion can be stripped away from it, in, then it can be applied uh, to sort of almost all situations. I think that's what we're working on.